The bottom line is that we can now take a person, realize that they're dreaming, stimulate the front of their brain, and then wake them up in their dreams so they can get control of their dreams and they get to play. And this works on everyone. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Growth Minds. Today, we've got a very special guest. His name is Moran Surf. Uh, he also loves to surf, as his uh, Skype username is, shows. And uh, he lived, lived in California. He's got a PhD. Uh, he's a neuroscientist. He's got one of the most fascinating stories I've ever heard. It still astonishes me after I've done 40 of these episodes that there's still people that are extraordinary uh, like yourself. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, so one of my greatest joys is, as I mentioned, is, is to discover and to speak with people like yourself. And one of the things that really fascinated me, as we mentioned, I, I recently saw you with uh, Tom Bill Yu on Impact Theory. And I just got this sense that you have this like insane curiosity. Maybe this is something you've developed as a child, uh, but you've done everything from uh, you've been a hacker, you've been a neuroscientist. Obviously, you're now working with Hollywood, you're a professor, like you are diving yourself into so many different fields. It's almost like you've lived two or three different lives uh, for, for like a human being. So I'm so curious to know what is it that how did you develop this kind of curiosity? So my Jewish mom would say that this is an, a sign that I don't uh, find anything that I stay with and that it's time that I stick with one thing and uh, found my thing and not change. So, so it could be spent uh, as a negative. I think that if we start with my mom, I would say that she has stories that she loves to tell about my childhood where I was encouraged to explore and be curious and kind of experiment with everything. And many times when I did something bad, my mom said, why did you break the vase? I would use this argument against her. I would say, you said I should be exploratory and investigate and curious. So I try to see how gravity works. That's why I dropped the vase. I try to see what happens when you uh, tie the cat to the door as an experiment. So I think that I, I, as a young kid, realized that if you spin things as an experiment, as a new being curious, people say, okay, that's actually a legitimate thing to do. So I tried a lot of things and I think it stayed with me as an adult in that, okay, like, Everything that uh, exists is an experiment that you can try and play with. And I'm enjoying it tremendously doing just like trying different things. Yeah, it's interesting that your mom thought it as a negative because I guess some people could say that, you know, you should have some, some sort of focus and stick to one thing and kind of peg you into this one hole. But it doesn't work for everyone, right? Some people thrive in doing multiple projects and discovering multiple things like yourself. There's this uh, uh, quote kind of, you know, uh, what is it like a master of uh, master non? Of, yeah, uh, master of none. I forget what the, uh, how the how the quote goes, but I think that the, the point is that like a, I think it's like like a jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, that kind of mm. suggests that you should really kind of find your thing and be really the best at that. But I think that the sentence should be jack of all trades, uh, master of none, but better than master of one. So I think that uh, that's my motto. I think that. If you're really, really good in only one thing, but the best at it, sometimes people that are average on a lot of things might be actually more useful to our world. Mm. Uh, you know, like when you're kind of going on a trip with uh, friends, I think that there's value to the people who know a little bit about a lot of things, who can kind of take you in different directions, than the one who's an expert on one thing. Sometimes on some domains, the expert is the one you're going to turn to, but in many times in life, you want people that have a little bit of like, Kind of broader uh, view, and I think that I advocate for that. No kidding, yeah. And it for you particularly, it's just this insane curiosity because I've always felt that it's it's really one of the greatest superpowers that we can have in today's modern age because information is so abundant, but the willingness to learn is not. We can tap a button and we can Google pretty much everything that we want, and that's only accelerating, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the the, the what, there are a few skills that I would teach anyone, and one of them is the skill of learning. So I, I would actually teach in a school to kids right now how to learn. It would be an entire class, it's how to learn, and then every meeting would be about a different topic. Today we're going to learn physics, and the point is, come back to me in half an hour, 
and tell me what is relativity speaking about. And they would have to find it themselves. And then the next class is going to be about biology and explain what CRISPR is. And the third one would be about history and tell me uh, what was Stalin's biggest kind of uh, 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 problem with uh, uh, you know, his governance. So every class would be something else. And the point is that you would kind of take people and move them domains and have them learn how to learn. And I think that will mm. be more valuable to them as they grow up than actually being perfect in one or the other. Interesting. And how would that be different than some of the educational institutions that do this through lectures at universities? So I think that there, there are kind of, it's a, it's a big topic right now, education and how learning should happen because definitely people cannot go to schools as much and because of kind of epidemics. And we're also starting to realize that even if they go to school, the method or the, the way we used to do it before isn't really the best we can. So what I mean by that is we are using the same school system that was developed hundreds of years ago. And back then it was really useful to be efficient. So they put as many brains in one room and try to broadcast information at them. Right now, we know that people have access to information in various places, not just in the classroom, but also on YouTube and on Hulu and on Netflix and in a book and with a conversation and a lot of kind of ways to get information. And also that brains learn differently. So uh, you might be the kind of guy that learns best when uh, someone talks to you one on one. And someone else is best when they're in a big crowd and information gets broadcasted. And a third person uh, might really learn very well facts, but has hard time learning numbers. So the point is that right now we put all of the brains in one room and we do the same thing with all of them and we hope that it's going to catch. But maybe there's a way to kind of say, let's find all the brains that are similar and put them in a classroom. So the teacher that teaches really well facts will teach people who can learn by facts. And a teacher who teaches really well narratives will teach people who need narrative. And actually, it might not be the same age. Maybe a six-year-old, a nine-year-old, and an eight-year-old that are similar brain-wise should be in the same classroom rather than all six-year-olds together, all seven-year-olds together, all nine-year-olds together. So you can actually start crafting classrooms based on brain and learning style rather than based on age or location or geography and so on. And I think this kind of radically changes how we think about teaching. Yeah, yeah. From from what I understand, the the at least the U.S. education system and perhaps in the Western world, it was modified not really modified, but it was really brought and adopted through what happened through Pr Prussia, right? Because they realized mm -hmm. that they needed yeah. to train soldiers and efficiency was everything. Um, I I'm curious to know, how does one actually figure out how, t like what their best learning style is when they've just gone through this system for their entire lives? So there are kind of two ways. One is the way of neuroscience uh, research, which is very, very accurate, but it's not affordable for everyone and not really accessible to everyone. So I would say that this one isn't really a possibility for a lot of people, but I'll tell you in a second what it is. And the other one is to self-experiment. So let's start with the easy one just to kind of uh, explain what some, everyone can do. It's relatively easy for you to learn something about your brain profile by experimenting with your brain. And here is how. You take a piece of paper, you write an adopt diary, and for the next seven days, you keep track of uh, moments where you make decisions and the environment around them. So for example, let's say today you're going to go have lunch and you're going to be with a friend and on the menu there's going to be salmon, steak, and salad. What you do is before you make a choice, you put on your little paper, I had lunch, I was with this person, this is the temperature around me, this is how stressed I am, this is a, anything you can think about that you think might be relevant for the information, this is how hungry I was and so on. The options were A, B, and C and I chose B. You write that down and you move on in your life. And you try to write for one week as many things that you can about your choices. So you kind of say, uh, how did I choose when to eat, who to spend time with, who to talk to, what to do, what to watch, anything that you did, you try to kind of, as much as you can, keep a diary of that. When the week is over, you go back to this list and you grade the success of each choice. You say, when I chose on Monday to have the steak, it actually made me very happy. I'm giving it like a plus. When I chose to watch this TV show, I was actually feeling that it was a waste of time, a minus. And you kind of rank them, and then you look back at your entire week, and you say, okay, how many times when I made choices that are a plus, that are positive, I was with this person? Or it was hot outside, or I was hungry, or it was in the morning. You kind of try to derive some, come, some kind of underlying roots of the choices and the decisions and the moments that you feel good. And you can do that for decisions, you can do it for learning. Like when I learned this fact, what, what was I doing, or what was the environment? And you will start seeing very quickly that there are patterns. So it doesn't require months of ages of doing it. It just requires attention to it for a week. And you will already see some patterns. And in a way, that's the easy way that everyone can do. The complicated way is that neuroscientists can actually do it for you by looking at your brain. So they would put something on your head when you make this choice, and they would actually tell you what goes on in your mind. This is an even more accurate version of the first option, 
but of course it's not as accessible to everyone because you have to have a neuroscientist look at your brain. But the point I'm making in one sentence is if you experiment with yourself, if you kind of uh, look at moments when you make choices and you code them, moments when you learn, moments when you interact and you kind of try to just code what happened and value that afterwards to see how well it went, you will know something about how you do things and you can actually make predictions about your future. Interesting, interesting, wow. Yeah, this, this is something we didn't get into uh, before our, our chat, but I should have mentioned that one, uh, one of the companies that I run is a language learning app. And what we're using is a mixture of AI and speech recognition that allows people to speak a new language confidently. Uh, so it's all speaking, there's no finger touching or anything like that. And the entire app is built around that. And I would actually love to kind of transition and, and take, for example, a language learning uh, process is kind of dreadful for most people. They associate that with going to the gym and you kind of need to put up a daily habit. Um, how can we use this, the neuroscience to help people develop the habits uh, and to successfully learn a language in the long run? So first of all, I would say, preface that how much I encourage learning languages. In a way, I think that the passport to different countries isn't the actual passport with a stamp, it's language. If mm. you speak the language of a different nationality, different ethnicity, different group, different culture, you know a lot more about them than ever before. In fact, it is a tangent, but I'm gonna go back to your question in a second. We know that language is one of the best way to shape thoughts. Uh, we know that uh, when you uh, use different languages to ask a question, you can actually shape the answer. If I ask you, if you're in a trial and someone asks you how fast were the cars when they hit each other versus how fast were they when they blasted each other? So it's the same question, but blasted immediately implies faster. People actually increase about two miles, 25 miles per hour to the answer just because they imagine blasting rather than hitting each other. So language wow. really shapes our thinking. So that's just that. I would say more than that. Uh, we have now more and more evidence on language that says that people actually change their brain based on language we use. There's a famous study on a tribe in the kind of a, a, a tribe in Africa that doesn't have a language for the word uh, left and right. They don't have like the, those words don't exist in their language, uh, but they used uh, directions like north, south, east, west uh, a lot. So they would say something like, uh, you have an ant crawling on your northeast arm. That's how they would describe it. Now, mm. what's interesting about this tribe is that uh, because they have to use language to describe directions all the time without having left and right, they become amazingly good in knowing where they are in the world. So you can take a person from this tribe and turn them around 10 times, kind of eyes closed, and then open their eyes and say, where is north? And they just say, it's there. The same way you just always know where right and left is. It's obvious to you, aligned to yourself. They just know exactly where north and south and east and west are all the time. And accordingly, their brain hippocampus, the part of the brain that actually controls navigation, is bigger. So it's somehow that their brain learned to encode the world differently because they have different language to describe the world. So all of that is a tangent to say that language is extremely important. And if there's kind of one thing that people can do right now when they're at, locked at home to help themselves is learn a language. It, it, it will change their lives. Suddenly they will see different uh, kind of more colors in the world that they uh, live in right now because they'll be able to describe it differently. Now, how can we do that? I think that the barrier is that uh, learning language starts with memory. At some point you have to kind of memorize a lot of words. When I started to learn languages uh, as a younger uh, kid, uh, I, I grew bilingual, I was born in one country, I had to move to another one, then I moved to the US, a third one, I had to learn English also, so I had to kind of learn a few languages. Uh, at some point, I was forced, uh, I, I took a, uh, my master's was in humanities and philosophy, and when you do humanities, you're forced to learn a new language, it's part of like the requirement, and I chose randomly a language that at the time seemed obscure and had no kind of connection to my life, I never needed it, which was Czech, so I just decided I'm gonna study Czech, huh. and I studied Czech, and it happened to be that the teacher was a linguist himself. So he was kind of a, a student of linguistics who was kind of told you're gonna teach the Czech class because you know it and uh, and we need that. So it was only three students and the professor, that's all we were. And I was dreading that because I said like, how can I even start you language that I don't have anything to do with and not, I've never heard it before. And he said one thing that to me was extremely helpful and I, maybe it's gonna helpful, be helpful to your audience. He said, if you know 1000 words in a language, you are able to read the newspaper. And suddenly this number, 1,000, seemed tangible. So if someone says, learn a language, it feels, okay, there's no way to grasp it, it's infinite. But he said it's only 1,000 words is what linguists say is a number you need in order to be able to actually converse in a language, to read a newspaper, to kind of get by. You need to know a little bit like the grammar and so on, but 1,000 languages, 1,000 words in a language isn't infinite. And then he said, we're gonna have two years together and we're gonna study 20 every week 
you know, 52 weeks a year, we're gonna get to 1,000 very quickly, and then we're gonna just keep practicing them. So you broke it to 1,000, but it was broken to 20 a week across 52 weeks. Suddenly we learned Czech in a way by having a goal that was there. So when people study language many times, they don't really know how much there's gonna be. Like they know the journey starts, but they have no idea kind of how far they are. They don't know, okay, we have to wait to learn this thing. And it doesn't go linearly. Like you don't know after three weeks that you actually made a progress. It kind of feels, I still cannot speak Chinese, so I made probably no progress. But you actually have, it's just like it goes like this. Like you, you mm. feel like nothing and suddenly everything works out. So when you, have, when you break it to some kind of a path that you can see, suddenly language becomes tangible, and I think everyone can realize that, okay, they can learn a new language entirely in short time using an app or software or a guide and master that. And I think this gives people and gave me back then encouragement, and it worked out. I speak Czech. Wow, that's fascinating. And is it the thousand most common words in a specific language? Yes. So I, th I think, mm. I mean, and I think it does change, you know, based on language. It was kind of a big number that helped me. Uh, some languages are a little bit more complex. Some languages uh, like, uh, require also a shift of style. So for instance, Russian, uh, you change nouns in, in, in Russian and in some Slavic languages like, 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 like it, like you actually, like your name, Sean, would actually be spelled differently and said differently if you're the subject or the object of a sentence, where in mm. most languages in the Western world, Sean is Sean, like you never change that. Like, like uh, you, Moran goes to the supermarket or, or Moran who was seen by a friend, they're all Moran. Uh, in some languages, if, if Moran is seen by a friend, it's like actually Morana uh, suddenly instead of like, so people like, so, so th th those conceptual changes actually require people to adjust their thinking about languages. So suddenly it becomes a bit more complex, but for if we, kind of the audience needs a take home message, 1000 roughly, and ideally, of those, the majority should be the ones that are kind of conversational, uh, conversational that are kind of used, like, where is this? Thank you, please help me, and so on. This is enough to read a newspaper. And that's, I think, mm. to me, a big kind of milestone that you can say, okay, I'm going to speak, I'm going to be able to read a newspaper in Korean in six months. That sounds like a good thing to do. Mm. And the idea, I guess, is that even in English, we don't actually use most of the vocabulary that we don't we don't we know right we don't use aardvark yeah. we don't use words like idiosyncratic every sentence so it, it totally makes sense to me you just have to focus on those very and once uh, we actually learn the the kind of core we start learning without being taught it's kind of unsupervised learning suddenly like you, you might know nine words out of the ten in a sentence but with those nine you can actually infer the tenth one so even if you don't know suddenly the learning happens it's no longer like you learn by kind of registering one more word and putting it in a bank at some point, you have enough vocabulary to figure out the other meanings of words that you don't know just by kind of context. And suddenly you can keep learning and, and you ju the jump from like 600 to 700 might happen not just by learning one more, 100 more the same way you learn from zero to 100. It's just you kind of start getting them. You, you start seeing meaning. You start seeing, oh, this one looks exactly like this one. Oh, but it's actually a reverse. So when you reverse mm -hmm. in this language, you just use the word A before and you start kind of the, the not all the 1000 are equal. Like you kind of once you learn something, you start inferring languages by yourself. So it becomes mm -hmm. even easier. So I, I wanted to pick your brain about this because I've tried this multiple times and I've, I've heard other people try it. It hasn't been verified. I've, I'm, I'm reading going through like articles that doesn't seem legit, but I'm curious to know. So people have a lot of people seem to think that when you are about to go to bed, let's say you're learning a language and you are, let's say, uh, listening to an audio version of someone speaking in Spanish because you're learning Spanish and you decide to do this every single day for 30 days, and you just go to bed with someone speaking Spanish to you, someone trying to speak Spanish to you. Because um, I know you're big into uh, like dreams. I'm curious to know how effective is that really uh, triggering into your brain? So that's a great question because it's such a sought after thing and we should kind of uh, be clear about that. So there's a huge, interest right now among a lot of people from companies to academics to the world in teaching people things when they're sleeping. That's kind of, you know, you want to go to sleep and wake up knowing Kung Fu. That's basically what we all want. Doesn't work. We have not found a way yet to have a person go to sleep, not knowing something, have their brain learn that while they're sleeping such that they wake up and they know it. This we didn't find a way to do. However, we do have some things we can do that are heading in this direction. We can teach you something when you're awake before you go to sleep, have you go to sleep, and then cement it when you're sleeping. So have your brain rehearse that and practice that even though you're not there to actively, consciously be aware of that. So your brain mm. keeps rehearsing. And then when you wake up, you actually know it better than you did before you went to sleep. 
because our brain rehearsed that. And that's, that, that still means that you have to do some of the heavy lifting of actually reading the Wikipedia entry or doing the math equation or practicing something before you go to sleep. But we can make your brain rehearse it more and then you know it better. So you can uh, play the piano a little bit before you go to sleep and we can actually make your brain keep replaying the same kind of sonnet in your mind when you're sleeping and in a way you move your fingers and kind of practice the, 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 the gestures such as when you wake up and you try to play the same sonnet, you are actually better. We can uh, make you practice your golf swing a little bit more in your sleep having learned how to do it when you're awake. We can even take knowledge like knowledge, uh, academic knowledge. So you, you read the, the Wikipedia entry uh, of the, I don't know, French Revolution, and you want to know when it happened, uh, how long it lasted, what was kind of the July 14th event, and so on. You learn that, you put it in yourself, but we will make your brain rehearse that overnight using cues from the outside world that activate your memory. And then when you wake up, we test you on that, and you actually perform better than you mm. would on things that we didn't practice. So, so there's something there, and that's kind of close to what you want, but I think the key thing, and that's what, what kind of is disappointing to some of the readers, uh, of this kind of uh, text is that uh, it's not just about uh, playing it throughout when you sleep. If you do that, your brain kind of masks it. It, it, your brain flags it as noise and stop listening. You have to actually turn it on and turn it off in the right moment. So a sleep, like let's say a seven hour sleep isn't just a uniform long thing that takes seven hours. It's broken into periods and there are some moments where your brain is focused on rehearsing things and different moments where the brain is actually trying to recalibrate existing things and so on. And you have to kind of target the brain with uh, this process of like making it rehearse things only in the right window. So if you just play sound the entire time, your brain is going to kind of wash it off and say like, okay, there's a cacophony of sounds coming. They're just mm. bothering me and I can't sleep. Just ignore everything and kind of shut the door. So you have to kind of hit the brain in the right moment and then it actually listens. And, and I think this means that you have to know something about your brain and about sleep to activate in the right time. So we're still kind of working on devices that will help us know when you're in the right moment and then turn on something. But up until that, if you just go to sleep and you kind of press play on a tape that teaches you Spanish, you will probably forget everything. Oh, interesting. So that's something that's actually being worked on right now. That's something yes. that you can, and how would that work? Is that something you can, like a device you can buy? One of like those meditation things that people wear, Not I forgot so. what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so they, they kind of, there, there are multiple companies that kind of compete on what's the best way, but, but generally the brain and the body they code in various ways the sleep stages. So we call this like event that happens uh, during the night a uh, sleep stage. And uh, they're kind of every 90 minutes you kind of move through a cycle. So uh, like you have like, let's call them sleep stage one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four happens 90 minutes. And then again, one, two, three, four, and then again, and again. And mm -hmm. in between those 90 minutes, there are kind of different things that take longer. Sometimes like the dreams take 20 minutes and they take five minutes. They kind of change in length during the night. And there's the window, the stage three, we call it slow wave sleep. That's the moment where your brain is most receptive to outside information and actually learns. If we hit the brain in this moment, that's when the learning happens. So we need to know that you're in this stage. Now to know that, there are a few ways. One is that usually when you're in this stage, you're breathing very, very kind of uh, uniformly, like in the same kind of uh, uh, speed, the same frequency. You, let, let, you toss and turn less. You're less likely to wake up. Kind of people wake up in the middle of the night. Occasionally, you're less likely to wake up in this moment. Uh, so there are devices kind of ranging from the Fitbit to companies that try to kind of monitor using ultrasound uh, between the sheets, how much you move your chest and infer how much you move and so on. And other companies basically put something on your forehead, a little kind of gadget that actually measures brain activity and tries to report to a machine on the outside. And all of those try to get at the same thing at the same time, which is how much you move, how do you breathe, are you in the state where you're right now receptive information and then target you with information. Hmm. And I think that uh, the competition is like they try to make it you know, more efficient, less cumbersome, so people will feel comfortable sleeping with it. So that's kind of why it's not out there yet, because they're trying to constantly play with what's the best product. But I imagine that uh, by, I would say, a year from now, you will already have one of those companies offer a product that goes, you go to sleep with, and it does something to at least make you sleep better, wake up at the right time, uh, get some access to your dreams, and also practice a little bit of memories in your sleep. Dreams, interesting. Do you, do you think that same technology or similar technology can be used to help you do more lucid dreaming? Yes, so lucid dreaming is one thing that, that I personally am playing with a lot. Right now, lucid dreaming, so if, if no one uh, knows what it, if someone doesn't know what it is, we should just say, lucid dreaming is a thing where some people, at some point in the middle of the night while they're dreaming, kind of wake up, but they're not wake up. What it is, is that they wake up from their dream and they realize that they're dreaming. So they're still asleep, 
but they have consciousness. They say, oh, I'm dreaming. And once they realize, they say, I'm dreaming and I'm in control of the dream. Let's see what I can do. And they say, I want to see if I can fly. And boom, they start flying. And they say, okay, I want to bring a Mahatma Gandhi to join me in my dream. And boom, he shows up in the room. So you're kind of, you're kind of a director of your dream. So this allows you to basically direct the film that your brain creates with whatever you want. And the reality is that about 12% of the population has this skill naturally. They just do that. And the rest of us don't. So the question is, can this be learned? Now, there's in San Francisco a big kind of movement to try to train people to do that. And they try to kind of make you, you know, uh, practice waking up in the middle of the dream. They wake you up themselves and they t- try to go to sleep. They try all kinds of techniques that are behavioral. But what neuroscientists like myself are doing is to say, okay, we can know that you're dreaming by looking at your brain waves using these devices, the, the devices you wear on you or monitor your sleep or look, or look at your brain. So we can then stimulate your brain and basically activate the part of the brain in the front that is you being awake, like we kind of a, a conscious, basically we kind of activate your, your amplified consciousness. And this seems to work very, very well. There's now a bunch of academic papers that show that it works and they are now playing with just kind of how much stimulation to do. Does it work the same way if you do it in the beginning of the night or the end of the night? But that's like technicalities right now. Now it's engineers trying to perfect it. But the bottom line is that we can now take a person, realize that they're dreaming, stimulate the front of their brain and then wake them up in their dreams so they can get control of their dreams and they get to play. And this works on everyone so this is no longer 12 percent. everyone can have that so once this is out there it's it's a cool you know you become the steven spielberg of your own dreams you can start directing them and like you know bringing people into the dream and do fun stuff i mean it's just insane i've I've only had the opportunity to do it twice and i've tried to get back it's almost like i'm like the inception and trying to get back into the dreams i can't get enough and one of the things i've heard is to journal the moment you wake up exactly what you were thinking about when you were dreaming, but I, I just couldn't get back there. But um, I, I'm curious to know, you know, for people that apart from the cool idea of just being able to control everything in your dreams, are there benefits that can come from lucid dreaming repeatedly in our conscious life afterwards? So I'll give you a few, I'll give you two. So first of all, I should say, uh, besides kind of being cool, you know, a person can control their dreams and do whatever they want. There are a potential kind of uses for that. So for instance, there's a saying, a a suggested research that shows that uh, we're very creative in our dreams. We basically remove boundaries and we can think differently in our dreams. So if you have a problem that you're struggling with when you're awake, your dream brain might think of different solutions. Like it it would remove barriers, it would kind of fold things differently and it might see solutions that are not there. The thing is we mostly forget our dreams when we wake up. So if you can get in consciousness in your dream, you might say, okay, dreaming brain, let's take this problem that I've been struggling with for a while now, bring it to the dream and try to solve it for me. Like, let's see what you do with your dream. So suddenly we become, we'll have a new use of our own brain to solve problems without some barriers that we have in ourselves. It's kind of like using drugs in a way. So drugs are doing that in the same way. They, they remove barriers and you are a lot more open to kind of things that, that make no sense. In dreams, you have no problem with like jumping time or meeting yourself, like seeing yourself not in first person but third person. So suddenly we can use that to actually solve problems. So if you're lucid dreaming, you can actually choose to bring things that bother you in the awake world into the dream and also remember them. So that's kind of a, one particular use that's very, very uh, popular without entertainment, uh, outside of the entertainment part, which is just, it's fun. And there's a, 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 a scientific kind of use that is really, really relevant to loose dreaming, which is you can actually report to the outside world things about your dream. So if right now uh, you ask people to tell you their dreams, most of them forget them when they wake up. It's very, very hard to remember your dream. The brain tries to eliminate them when we wake up and we have to fight our brain to remember them a tip, if you ask me, is to keep your eyes closed when you wake up. If you keep your eyes closed when you wake up, the chances of the outside world coming in is lowered because only sound and smells are coming in. And then you have a little bit more chance of actually remembering the dream. So if you wake up and you keep your eyes closed, you can actually remember the dream. You can, if you just speak it quickly, say, I dreamt of the ABC, and then you open your eyes, you will have moved the memory from one place to another by speaking it, and then you have a chance of remembering it. So that's kind of a tip. But the point that I was trying to make is that people that are lucid dreaming can actually communicate with the outside world and tell people what their dreams are and then they can actually remember them better. So the classical experiment that was done with those dreams that actually will uh, help the audience understand what I mean was an experiment that uh, asked the question, is time in dream same as time in reality? So people for a while have asked the question, like in a dream it feels like we do a lot of things, but if we only dream for 20 minutes in, in like a window of time, how could we have done so many things? It must be that in the dream, time is really, really fast. Like, like, Things run fast and, and it's much faster than the real world. 
And for a while, we had no way of answering this question. We just couldn't know if time in dreams is time in real in the real world. Actually, we had studies on tangent. I'm going all over the place, but I'm going to get close. We have experiments from uh, rats that look into their dreams that show that rats, when they dream, they actually dream in double speed and reverse. So rats in their dreams, like during the day, they navigate a maze. And when they go to sleep, you see them navigating the maze backwards in double speed. So oh. suggesting that maybe they're kind of dreaming about going in the maze backwards and so on. So there were a lot of theories that say maybe people in dreams dream faster, in reverse, in different ways, but we couldn't test it. Then came lucid dreamers and said, we're going to answer that in the following way. They closed their eyes being awake before they went to sleep. So they closed their eyes and they learned to kind of move their eyelids a little bit to signal uh, that uh, they control the, the motors, the kind of the, the, you know, the muscles of their eyes. So a lucid dreamer, when they were awake, closed their eyes and just kind of moved up and down the eyelids. And they moved them in a count of 20. One, two, three, four. And then they went to sleep. And when they went to sleep and they woke up during the dream, so they had control, they kept moving the eyelids again, counting one, two, three. And then on the outside world, we could compare how long it took them to count when they were awake, how long it took them to count when they were asleep. And you can compare, okay, they were counting to 20 in their dreams. They count to 20 when they were awake, and I can compare those two and see if it takes the same amount of time or if it takes a lot faster to count to 20 in their dream, meaning that they're actually dreaming in fast speed. And the answer finally came from the dreamers that actually dreams are in real time, same as you as, as awake, you just dream five minutes or 20 minutes and everything is in the same time. So this is something we could answer because of the dreamer. They could just report back to us, scientists, huh. from their dream, what's going on. They can tell us, here is, here is me counting for one minute in my dream. And that's it, we had an answer. Interesting, but how is it that because I take naps, I take power naps, and how is it that I can be like in one country and have done all of these different things, and then I look at my clock when I wake up, and it's been like three minutes. <laughs> so how do you explain something like that? I think the answer is that uh, you probably so it takes very little time to run through a memory compared to run to an action. So if I ask you right now to imagine your childhood, you can close mm. your eyes and you can run through the entire childhood in like one minute. It's like, it's very easy for us to, because we, we have all the facts, we can really run it in a, a so in the dreams, a lot of times we actually do, we jump from one place to place quickly and, and we don't have a, like when in your dream, when you walk from point A to point B, you basically start and you're at point B. We don't really see you walking. Like in dreams, you don't really walk for one mile and just like wait and see yourself walk. You just start and end. So the dream kind of makes it easy for you because you control the entire story. So you don't waste time on anything in between. When you uh, talk to people, and you tell a joke, the brain kind of knows the entire story, it doesn't really put the kind of the, the entry, it just goes to the pun. And that's it. The joke is told because you know the, the background and the brain just adds the bottom line. So the brain kind of cuts, uh, cuts a lot of time from our dream by jumping. And so dreams are usually in time, they're the same amount of time, but we just have, a, it's like a movie. We cut all the, you know, we cut the moment that she goes from like point A to point B and driving, just like see her leaving the house and getting there. So she drove the entire time. We believe that she took it at the same time, but we don't see all of that. Wow, wow. Do you think, because I know you're big into uh, brain-machine interfaces, uh, and obviously that technology is accelerating that day by day. Do you think there'll ever come a time when we can basically dream and we can just watch the dream on a television or on our Google Glasses or whatever it might be? Is that ever something that's possible? And it maybe might be good to give an overview of uh, what BMI is. Sure, so, so BMI, short for Brain Machine Interfaces, is a big kind of field where scientists are trying to connect the world directly to the brain. So you can control things in the world from your brain. So for instance, say you instead of like holding the wheel and making a left turn or right turn to move your car right or left, you just think, I wanna have my car move right, something reads your brain activity, controls the car, and the car just steers right. You think I wanna go left, and the car steers left. You uh, think the content of the email and something reads your brain activity and the email just gets written and you kind of think send and it gets sent. So, so everything that you right now use an interface called your arms or your legs is overridden. Instead of just actually typing the email with your hands and like the brain controls the hands, control the keyboard, control the uh, computer and so on, you just have directly connection between the brain and the computer. Hmm. Now, uh, there are a lot of kind of ways to do that. Companies uh, range from ones that try to just get closer to the brain by, let's like, say, looking at the skin of your face and having you twitch the muscles and control the, the computer from there, which is kind of close to the brain, but still an interface that is motor. Two companies that basically say, we're going to put an implant inside people's brain and have them 
control uh, the world outside. So that, that's kind of what brain-machine interfaces are. Yeah. Now, I think that uh, where it's going is towards us uh, having more direct interface with other people as well. So if you have a brain-machine interface, something that reads your brain activity and connects to things, and I have one, we don't have to just use a computer to email each other, but also can connect from my brain to your brain. And this is something that is being played with by scientists. So I think some scientists are doing it with rats right now. They actually put implants in the, in the brains of two rats, and they read the intentions of one rat. This was done by a colleague of mine, uh, Miguel Nicolelis, is in Duke and in Brazil. He read the intentions of one rat in Brazil, sent this reading to a rat in North Carolina, where the rat there just felt suddenly the urge to pull a lever. She goes and she pulls this lever. The pulling of this lever activates a, a device that sends a signal back to the one in, I think it was Rio de Janeiro, and then it mm. opens a cage with cheese. So this rat in Rio de Janeiro just think, I want this cage to be open, and second later it gets open. It doesn't know that actually information was sent to Duke and back for this to happen. So all of this wow. is like, where we're going with animals. No one's done it with humans. And the question you asked me that kind of was overarching this one is how good are we in, how close are we to actually reading dreams? Uh, the answer is uh, 2003, 2013, sorry, I said three. 2013 was the first work that showed that this is possible. So this was a, a work uh, by a colleague of mine, uh, Yuki Kamitani in Japan. Uh, and he, uh, in his lab, took people and scanned their brain using a machine called fMRI. It's a big magnet that you put your head inside and it injects magnetic fields through your head and it kind of measures what gets absorbed by mm. your thinking. And he had people, when they were awake, before they went to sleep, sit in front of a movie and watch a, a bunch of movies. So he kind of had, if it's you, if you're the subject, you're sitting there and you watch movies and he looks at your brain activity while you watch these movies. And what he sees is that when you see a red square, let's say, flying by from left to right, there's part of your brain that codes for the color red, part that codes for the, the shape square, parts that code for the movement left to right. So if you kind of combine all those three, you can tell the person right now is seeing a red square going from left to right. And mm -hmm. he basically did this mapping for a lot of things, how circles look, how squares look, how text looks, how a, a familiar person versus unfamiliar, woman versus men. He just mapped when people were awake, a lot of things on the back of their brain. That's where we kind of keep the imagery of the world. And then he had people go to sleep. And when he went to sleep, he again used this device that we mentioned that kind of allows you to know when the person is dreaming and doing other things. And he went for the dream. And when they were dreaming, he turned this decoder that kind of looked at their brain and tried to see what is it that they're seeing right now. And he said, oh, the person is dreaming right now and he's seeing a rectangle that's blue at the top. Maybe it's the sky. And this is another rectangle at the bottom, another one that looks like green that kind of stands out. Maybe it's a, a tree out of a grass. And he kind of started to infer from looking at imagery on people's brains when they were dreaming what is it that they're seeing? And then he wakes them up and he asks them. And then they say, well, I dreamt that I was with my mom walking in the forest. He says, okay, perfect. This is like a good match. I, I kind of know now how your brain looks when you're in the forest. Let's try again. They go to sleep. He wakes them up when they have a dream. They tell him what, he, what they think they dreamt. He looks at what his computer says. And he started to kind of get better and better in telling people that he can read what is it that they're dreaming. And this was the step one, 2013. Since then, we did a lot of things to progress there to the level that we can actually now really decode not just kind of the visual of the dream, what you're seeing, but also the semantic content. We can actually see that uh, you're seeing not just like a blue thing that we think is the sky, but also that you're seeing the sky uh, that you saw from your kind of home apartment when you were a kid. So we can start being even more granular. And again, it became from a neuroscience problem, mm. like an engineering problem. We proved that it works, and now engineers are trying to make it even better and perfect it. But that's kind of now a different problem that means that it soon you will have that in your life, a device that tells you when you wake up, what was your dream? So you can kind of compare what you remember to what the device says. Wow, wow. And what are the other possibilities if let's say our great grandchildren or maybe even our grandchildren have the opportunity to have this in a mainstream way? And I'm not sure exactly because I understand it's a very extreme procedure right now to have even rats go through this process, but could this potentially impact the longevity of human beings at an exponential level because as long as we can upload our brains into artificial bodies we can constantly update our bodies or am i completely off here <laughs> so I, I so i think you're touching on, on multiple points that are interesting so one I, i'll try to kind of tackle all of them and i know i'm speaking too too long on every answer so feel free to cut no me. no no uh, no anytime. 
So uh, one aspect of longevity that uh, neuroscientists have been playing with that's really creepy. Uh, it came out less than a year ago. I just spoke about it in a talk I gave two weeks ago that's going to become public in maybe a few days, mm. uh, is that we learned how to keep the brain of a person after they died active. Mm. So this was a study with pigs. It was never done with humans. But what happens basically in the study, if I simplify it, is that at 12 p.m., a pig is slaughtered in a slaughterhouse. And then they take its brain out just when it was slaughtered. And they put this brain in a dialysis machine. It's kind of in, kind of injects into it all the needed nutrients and blood and kind of keeps the brain basically active. And then this brain keeps acting like a living brain. It keeps like, you know, processing stuff. So this was a proof of concept that we can actually take the brain of something that died and keep the brain active. You can separate the brain from the body and keep probing the brain. So you can now create all kinds of science fiction ideas behind that, that if we do it with humans, we can maybe keep humans at least for a few hours after they died processing. And what processing means is everything. It means that you can maybe ask questions of a person who died. You can say, hey, who killed you? You know, like imagine the Sherlock Holmes movies that uh, start with Sherlock Holmes coming to the dead body and just ask her, who was it? This is the butler. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> that's, uh, that's it. So that's like that's one insane. imaginary thing. Or you can imagine a situation where you, you know, you ask someone like, okay, you died, but who does the will go to? Like, to who's getting the money? Or I want to say goodbye to grandma one more, last time after she died. All those things would be, in theory, a possibility if you can take a brain and keep it alive for hours or maybe longer after a person died. So that's kind of hmm. one answer to longevity. We actually can separate the body from the brain and keep you there for a while. That's spooky. We haven't done with humans. And even with pigs, it's unclear if they're still kind of processing or th thinking or just like circulating. But in a way, right. this was a big leap from nothing ever going to happen to, okay, we now know how to do that for a few hours. So that's, that's one answer to longevity. Then there's a more kind of philosophical answer to longevity, which is uh, there's a few labs. There are a few labs, a few colleagues of mine that uh, try to extract memories. So they kind of try to put something in your brain when you're alive that listens to your memory if you want and kind of tries to retrieve them and code them and then in a way puts them in different locations. So the, the example that I know of is also with rats. They take one rat that knows something, in that case navigate a maze, but they learn how its mapping works in the brain and put it in a digital chip that kind of listens or eavesdrops on the rat's movement and then they put it in a new rat's brain, one that has never seen the maze before and somehow the rat that has not seen the maze before knows how to navigate the maze as if like memory was transferred from one place to another. So this is again a very small memory and only with rats, all the caveats you can imagine. But the bottom line is that we just transfer memory from one animal to another. That's another way to extend longevity. You basically take Sean's memories when he's getting old and you just move them to someone else. And in many ways, our memories are our story. So you get to live longer, not by you living longer, but your kind of consciousness gets to live hmm. in some other place forever and you kind of retain more information. You suddenly get the experience of your forefathers in your brain. And then there's the kind of most concrete way of cheating death that, or kind of living longer that we are playing with, which is pure biology. Uh, right? People don't just die. It's not like a, it's not like a, a cell that one day it kind of stops functioning. Usually we die of something. And as we die of things, it becomes, again, an engineering problem. So if you die of a heart attack, long ago it was a doomsday thing, like you die and that's it. But now we know that heart is a pump and we can actually put different heart inside and you can even be without a heart for a few hours as long as there's a machine that's pumping blood into you. And we, while we find different hearts for you, we can keep you alive. So suddenly a heart is an organ that we can replace, same as lungs and, and same as kidneys and so on. So suddenly we start to understand that there's a lot of kind of uh, room for, uh, you know, parts in our body that we can replace. And if you take it to the extreme, you can start saying, okay, like a lot of things that fail, we can replace. Generally dying out of thing becomes an engineering problem. If this person dies from that, we need to kind of make sure that he doesn't get that or that and give him the right drugs that kind of will stop whatever process is killing him right now. And people could live, you know, forever with us constantly replacing parts. That there's a colleague of mine who said it kind of in a cynical way, but a beautiful way. Uh, he said, no one would agree to take to buy a computer, a laptop, if they had to sign a contract that says this laptop is the one you're gonna use for the next 80 years. That's it, you're never gonna change your laptop. Mm. We all buy laptops thinking, okay, we're gonna replace it when things kind of change in the world, but this is kind of how we treat our body. We basically are born with one and we say, this is it. This is the one I have for the next 80 years, not changing anything. And now we're basically saying, okay, this one is decaying. So maybe we can start giving you 
you know, new things that will make you get upgrades to this body and just keep living longer because all that is you is in your brain. So as long as we keep the brain in the container working, we can keep you alive longer. I should say as an ending to this long argument that it's not obvious that this is a good thing. Uh, kind of fear of dying has always been with humans. We always were afraid of that. I think that a lot of institutes uh, thrive because of that. Like we, we have churches and synagogues and places that basically tell you stories about the afterlife because they kind of promise that the next life is going to be much better. Like right now you're kind of working, you're rehearsing, but it's, it's the real thing is there. And, and we convince a lot of people to do things right now that are, you know, kind of affecting their current life because they believe that something better is going to come afterwards. And in that thing, we kind of uh, created an entire story that we live by right now without knowing a lot about the next one, but kind of having beliefs on, on what's coming next. And every religion and every kind of culture has a story that deals with the fact that, it's, that dying is so difficult for us, accepting the fact that we just cease to exist one day. So we had to kind of cope with it by inventing new stories. But it's not obvious that dying is not good in many ways. Uh, it gives meaning to life, the fact that there is an ending to it. You kind of, every event is meaningful. It also uh, means that life is divided into parts. Uh, it's not obvious, for instance, that you want to be old forever. Like if, if you give someone longevity, you might not want them to be frail and not with a clear mind and unable to move and a burden on a lot of their family and, and close friends since they're 100 to 900. Uh, we want, if anything, to to be kind of to even it out such that if you live in 900, the first 400, you're still youthful and energetic. So in many ways, we can solve the problem of not dying. But this isn't the solution necessarily that society wants to avoid it. We want to either change the meaning of life or change kind of how old age looks like and how we treat old people and how we treat like a brain that's not as much, it's not as good. So I went in three minutes over <laughs> a long kind of laundry list of like things that what we can do, how we yeah. can look in different domains, but also whether it's good and bad. I leave it to your audience and to you to think like where you stand on that because you can tell that I'm conflicted on, on whether it's good or bad. Yeah, I mean, it introduces a lot of difficulties and, and complications with that because with longevity, with overpopulation as, as an issue that we currently face right now, I mean, how do you deal with something like that? Do we all have to adopt some sort of a one-child policy like, like China had? Uh, do we, you know, like how, how do we actually deal with that? So you're kind of combating this conflict with the advancement of technology and I'm sure legislation is going to be involved with being able to control something like this. But yeah, you're right. It, it, it is a very complex critic. Definitely, I don't have the answers. Uh, I was, hope, I was <laughs> so hoping many things. someone out there would, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, think, I think we really have never thought about it. Like we, ver we, we live in our life thinking we're going to die. This is inherent in how we live our life. You know, we marry someone and we say, till death do us part. And somehow we think that, okay, like we're going to be together for the next 70 years. Suddenly imagine that you have to be together for the next 700 years. Right? Like it changes everything. Like when do you get married if you know that it's going to be a choice that you make age 20 for the next 800 and, uh, 880 years? It's a different thing. Uh, we're going to think differently about the future if, if we live longer. So right now, a lot of the problems with climate change, for instance, is that people that don't care about that won't live to see the, the consequences, right? Like they, they can, we can throw everything we want anywhere and kind of pollute the oceans and use plastics because it's going to be our great, great grandkids who are actually going to live in a world that suddenly has perpetual summer. We won't be there to enjoy, to, to suffer from that. So we kind of don't care about it right now. We kind of say it's never going to happen or it's going to happen to someone else. I don't care right now. If you're going to be there, maybe people are going to think, think differently. It affects how you save. Like right now you can kind of say, well, I'm going to spend all the money I have right now. Who knows what's going to happen when I'm 70? It seems so far. Suddenly it's not just about 70. It's like 700. Like mm -hmm. you have to kind of think right now how to save to that age. Uh, I can go on and on. Like we, we go to school at a young age, taking a new profession so we can start our career. But most people have one house in their life, one profession that they have in their life, uh, one marriage, like kind of people live life thinking it's going to be about 90 years. And they, in a way, without saying that, plan for that. They marry mm. at a certain age that will give them X amount of time. They study for a profession that they start. They think I'm going to advance and I'm going to become suddenly the senior person in 30 years. Everything is planned for a 19 years life. If you extend it suddenly, not only do we have to kind of give you more years, we have to change everything. People have to kind of start planning for a different lifestyle. And we have not done it before and we haven't thought about it, Billy. Wow. Okay. This is conspiracy theory. But if that is the case, obviously, there are smarter people than me that have thought about all this as, as you have. 
and I'm sure they know the economical effects to it, the the you know the climate change. There's all these different factors that come into that, right? Do you think it's possible that in the future that something like this can come, where maybe we don't live forever, but we can extend life to 200, 300, 400, but it's not going to ever be out in the public because of this exact uh, fact that you just put out, and it's only going to be available to maybe the 0.001 percent. So, okay, I'm going to write, so I won't forget the two things uh, that, that I have to say on that. So, um, first we should say that uh, as long as it's in the hands of scientists, at least there's some level of transparency because you know, scientists publish their papers publicly. So, so, in a way, the fact that we're talking right now is a service to everyone else because you take science that maybe others would not have access to and you put it out there so suddenly they all can weigh in on it and start you know asking their congressman or woman and kind of demanding from their work so so immediately there is a, a need for people to talk about it more so there are kind of two approaches to think about uh, the danger of knowledge in the hands of some but not everyone else one is that a lot more and more of the rich people of the world start to control the knowledge also. So Facebook, Amazon, Google, Twitter, Tesla, they, they can now own researcher by sponsoring research, by hiring my PhD students to work for them and so on. And in that, uh, they actually start owning knowledge. And they can choose to share it with everyone else or to make money out of that and not share it with everyone else. And, and we have like a, a challenge right now on who owns knowledge. When you discover something, whose is it? Is it everyone's? Or is it uh, those who worked how to get it? Is it of the country who got it? Uh, and, and this kind of poses questions that we have not had to deal with really before in that level, but are difficult right now. If tomorrow uh, France finds a vaccine for coronavirus, we assume that it's going to be international, that immediately they tell everyone else and, it, and everyone in the world, we don't think, okay, this is a French vaccine, let's find our own. Like we, kind of, we kind of think that the world in a way is coming together in advancement. So, you know, Israel and Iran have a lot of arguments on uh, nuclear weapon use, like whether Iran should have a nuclear weapon or not, and there's kind of a lot of battles of that, but none of them argues whether E equals MC square. That's established, and they all agree that the equations that build nuclear weapons are the same. And in that sense, science is kind of a leveling thing. If that's not going to be the case, we're in trouble, because suddenly it creates inequality that we've not seen before. Right now, there's inequality in the world, but it's in money. There's rich people and poor people, and it's unfair and it's not okay, and we try to kind of find ways to level that. But in a way, we accept that and we can we know how to deal with it. We, we've seen it for enough decades that we kind of are okay with some countries being poor and some countries being even richer, as long as we can maintain that and like no one is kind of suffering beyond something we can tolerate. There's no starvation. There's no famine. Uh, uh, that's that's the level that we're trying to. But if the world has inequality in smarts, in knowledge, we're going to have totally kind of different uh, levels of uh, access that maybe we won't be able to, to stand. So if there's a class of people that are so smart that they really can communicate with each other directly through their brain and they don't die because they have all the knowledge on healthcare that they need and so on, and us mortals are, then we really kind of go into a level where the best example I can think of is us versus animals. So humans right now are one class and animals are a different class. And we take the smartest animal out there, like this, the smartest ape, kind of the bonobo ape that can communicate using signs and, and like do basic math. And we're so impressed by it. We say, look at this amazing bonobo. It acts like a two-year-old kid. It can do things that two-year-old kids can do. And it's amazing. We're so impressed by that. There's a chance that those new humans with the smarts that is beyond the, the smarts that we have will talk about us the same way. Say, look at this uh, cute Sean. It can do a, a differential equation in his mind, just like Timmy here. Uh, we can let's 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 put Timmy back in the in the cradle and let's put Sean back in the in, in the cage and give him bananas. Uh, in the <laughs> same way, I think that I think that the forking that could happen because of inequality in smarts could really create two races, humans mm. and superhumans. And we're gonna be wow. not necessarily the ones in the good side of the equation. So I think that it's time to think about it right now. No kidding. And this, this introduces another catch-22 because I would imagine the companies that have the resources to be able to fund or if not create this kind of technology in the future are going to be 
the ones that already have a lot of the data that we are giving to them, basically, uh, which yep. are I mean, potentially the Facebooks of the world. Uh, you know, you got Google, Apple, all these different companies, and I'm sure there's going to be more in the future. And we are, they already have so much data about us, and there's already this controversy of how much data should we give them. So imagine, I mean, just imagining if they can literally have an interface and have all the data of the neurons in our brains and everything that we're thinking. Uh, it's a catch-22 because someone might want that because, as you mentioned, they want to be part of the superhuman class and they want to get ahead. And it's going to be unfair for someone that maybe even has the resources but doesn't want to do that because they don't want to give away every single thing uh, to these companies. But you kind of have to. It's almost like not having a smartphone this day, this day and age because you feel like Google's tracking you. So you know, in your mind, how do you go overcome that catch 22? Do you think it's just going to be a legislation thing that just limits it? Or, you know, I'm sure you've thought about some of this stuff. So there's a lot to unpack on this. I'm going to try my best. So first of all, here's the quote that I like that helps me think about it. Uh, there was an episode of The Simpsons uh, that I watched when I was a kid where Mr. Simpson becomes a uh, Homer Simpson becomes really good friends with Mr. Burns, the, the owner of the famous kind of a nuclear factory. So normally it's like the richest guy and the, the employee and they're normally kind of different casts and suddenly they become good friends. And there's a moment where they kind of sit, the two of them uh, together and they chat and Mr. Simpson tells uh, uh, Mr. Burns, uh, what Mr. Homer Simpson tells Mr. Burns, Mr. Burns, you are the richest guy I know. And Mr. Burns says, and I would give it all up for a little more. And I think that's uh, kind of how we are. Uh, we constantly are greedy and we're very, very much excited by the new gadget after that gives us a little bit like advantages, a little bit more IQ, a little bit uh, less desire to be with ourselves, less kind of worry that we're going to be alone for a second. So here's one more gadget that can fill the one minute where you're in the elevator uh, or the two minutes you wait for the bus. So in that sense, we kind of greedy and constantly seek one more thing to fill our time, to give us a little bit more edge. And in that sense, we're risking indeed not having a kind of giving a, a lot of our data to someone else. Now, I think that the way by which I think about it that I think is uh, helping me prepare for this is in, in the context of a race. I think there's a race uh, between you and Silicon Valley right. to know you best. Uh, you know, when I was a kid and I studied philosophy, we studied about the Oracle of Delphi that had basically this sign at the entrance the city that said, know thyself. And this was the biggest virtue of the time. Uh, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, what they were after is knowing themselves. And they studied philosophy and they kind of debated and conversed. And this was their way to get into their inner mind and understand who they really are. In the years uh, since, we developed other ways to know ourselves. Now people can engage in art, you can play music, you can paint, and suddenly you get kind of access to your inner soul. You can go to therapy and talk about yourself and maybe someone will help you understand who you are better. You can meditate. There are many ways we developed that allow us to get into ourselves and know ourselves. However, what's common to all of these things is that there are privilege, as in if you have enough time or you can afford to not work two jobs and have two kids and spend time going to a mountain and meditating, you should do that. But some of us don't have the time to do that and we are just kind of living our life. Mm -hmm. And it was okay. Those who could did it and those who couldn't didn't do it and it was okay. You could live life without knowing yourself and it wasn't a big deal. But right now we live in an era where there's a race because Facebook and Twitter and Google, they're in the business of knowing you. Their business model is knowing you. The more they know about you, the better they can sell you to other companies. So they are constantly having a lot of engineers sitting out there and trying to understand who you are by things you do. And we no longer can afford to not know ourselves because they will. So if we don't do it, someone else will and will just sell us. So we have to now sit and meditate and read and introspect and do music and, and, and like go to therapy. And we have to do a lot of things just to keep up with the fact that the world is after us. And each and every mm. one of us is a target. And in that sense, I think that this is a race. That's how I see it. And we have to really make an effort to know it. And I think that the challenge that we have, and that is maybe kind of uh, aligned with what your audience is taking from that as a concrete idea, is that there's also good things about it. Having those superhumans who will be super smart will mean that they might find a cure for cancer. They will be so smart that they could immediately see patterns that we don't see and they say, here's a cure for cancer. 
okay. or they will be able to solve the problems of a uh, famine, right? If there's someone who doesn't have food and someone who has food, they can orchestrate a really complex solution that will distribute food. So they can do things that will help the world. It's just that in getting the good things, we'll also bring a barrage of new things that we won't be able to, to, com- to kind of compete with. So I think that the challenge is for every person who listens to this right now to imagine both ends and say, am I okay with the world having this if I'm not part of it? That, that's the, the question you should ask yourself. Like, what if, like, do I want to live in a world where there are infinitely rich people if I'm not? If you say I'm okay with that, then it's the same with IQ. You should be okay with having people that are very, very smart because they're gonna do good things for you, but you won't be part, part of them. If you say, mm-hmm. no, I prefer equality, then you should fight for equality in money, in smarts, in every domain that you think you wanna be part of. And I think that's kind of the challenge we, we have to decide and everyone for themselves have to decide right now, but it's very clear right now what are the choices we have to make. So you can do it yourself. Well, I, I couldn't think of a more powerful way to end that, especially with that question. I'm sure people are gonna be staying up all night, mm-hmm. hopefully lucid dreaming <laughs> through that question. Uh, this has been great, Moran. I definitely want to do a part two because there are so many things that I didn't have time to get over, but I also want to respect your time. Uh, where can people find you online and how can people learn more about your work and everything that you're doing? I'm the easiest guy to access. I'm, I'm a scientist, so everything I do is public. If you just Google my name, Moran Surf, you find my website and I try to put everything. As soon as this is out, it's going to be linked to from my website. So everything I do, I try to put there. So I'm the easiest access and I answer my emails. People email me all the time with like questions, like from kids to people in different countries who have an idea and a thought. I, I'm, I think I feel that it's my duty to make things accessible. So I do as much as I can of these conversations that try to kind of communicate what I do. And I answer the emails and I, if I see that some questions come again and again, I write something about it or I come. So really, I'm there for whoever has thoughts that are relevant and could be helpful too. That's amazing. Well, the world is better for it. So thank you so much, Moran. This has been a fascinating conversation. I hope people learn more about you all the place. We'll link all that in the conversation and uh, we'd love to have you back because this has been amazing. Promise. Happily. It was great. Beautiful. All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next week.